Good evening, everyone. Thank you for coming out to this debate. Very interesting topic, and I'd like to thank Abdullah and Yahya uh, for the opening presentation. For attempting to show us uh, that Islam is a religion of peace. So we thank them especially for presenting their view in a forum such as this. It's rare that we get to interact with these views. A lot of times people will bring up their views, but there's never really an opportunity to challenge them. Uh, i just like to say here at the beginning that uh, I really like Abdullah's version of Islam. If he, uh, if he writes his own tafsir, I will help you spread that tafsir. If he comes out with his own uh, footnotes to the Quran, I will, I will help you spread that Quran. Uh, in the meantime, we are stuck with very different commentaries. Uh, Ibn Abbas, Ibn Kathir, we're stuck with different uh, translations of the Quran. So I think uh, we arrive at some different conclusions. But there are some points of, of formal agreement between us, some, some points where we agree with things that he has said. Um, he said the modest dress is good. We have no objections to that. We agree completely, and that is uh, something common to Islam and Christianity. Uh, he says uh, whether Islam is violent or not is separate from whether it's true or not. And I agree completely. God could, God could command violence if he wanted to, if he wanted a certain group judged, he could. Uh, the question is whether he has, whether Christianity is true, whether Islam is true. Um, so if Islam is true, I'll just say, it. if Islam is true, I believe that uh, some violence is required. Um, he said that punishments aren't necessarily bad. I agree completely. I agree that we have uh, prisons in the UK and in the United States to uh, keep certain uh, criminals separate from the rest of the society. So uh, we agree with, with, uh, with, with all of these things, uh, but it's on some of the other issues that we're going to have some disagreements about. <laughs> well, see, I, I kind of agreed with Abdullah when I was still a Muslim. I believe that Islam was very peaceful. It's the version of Islam I had been taught that uh, jihad was a jihad of the spirit and of the pen, not of the sword. That people were to live peacefully. Muhammad wouldn't hurt anyone unless they first declared war on Islam. That's what I believe. Uh, but as David said, I actually started reading the Tafsir, I started reading the Ahadith, and I realized that the history of Islam was entirely different. So then I started asking these questions. And recently, even as a Christian now, I ask these questions. I continually ask these questions. I went to a festival in Dearborn, Michigan a few weeks ago, and I asked the question there. Uh, ironically enough, I was met with violence. Um, and then uh, a week later, I asked the same question at ISNA, the Islamic Society of North America's National Convention. Here, everyone was promoting peace. It was a very peaceful concept. Wherever you went, all the scholars who were there were saying Islam is peaceful. Islam is very peaceful. Now, I, I began to think, is there some level of contradiction here? In the Quran, in the Hadith, we find some peaceful passages, some violent passages. Uh, in the Sierra literature, we find a lot of violence. Um, what, what do we see in, in real life today? Uh, unfortunately, we see a lot of violence being committed in the name of Islam. Now, just because people are committing the violence doesn't mean that that's part of Islam. That Muslims can take uh, the, the word Islam in vain and then commit violence in its name and it's not part of Islam. But it is pretty striking to see that these people are committing tons of violence. Uh, when, when I stopped yesterday, I said, well, let me just see how much violence has been committed in the name of Islam in this past week, just since I've been here in London since Wednesday, I realized that there were mass massacres, there were car bombings, church bombings, uh, left and right, so much so that we had, in, in the past five days, 28 separate incidents reported in, in newspapers around the world, which showed 210 people dead and over 1,900 people wounded. Um. And we, so the point is, we look to the world today and we see a violent Islam being proclaimed, we see a peaceful uh, Islam being proclaimed. And uh, we, interestingly, we find the same thing when we turn to the Quran. We turn to Surah 2, 256. There is no compulsion in religion, 
that's peaceful. Uh, then we turn to Surah 929. Fight those who believe not in Allah. We look at the uh, closing passage of Surah 109. Uh, to you be your religion and to me be my religion. Very peaceful. Uh, then we turn to Surah 95, when the sacred ones are over, slay the infidels wherever you find them. So we, we find the peaceful and violent passages going all the way back uh, to the beginning of Islam. The question is, how do we reconcile these? Are, are, these, are these simply contradictions? Or, uh, or is there a way to decide whether uh, Muslims are called today to be peaceful or to be violent? That's the question before us. And if you understand the way the Qur'an's revelation works, it's not necessary that in this case there's contradiction. Uh, in this very case, we have verses that say one thing and verses that say another thing, but do they contradict? Well, if you understand the, the doctrine of abrogation, you will understand that, no, the verses don't necessarily contradict. Now, where do we find the, verse of, or the concept of abrogation in the Qur'an? In chapter 2, verse 106 of the Qur'an, uh, Allah says, whatever com communications we cause to abrogate or cause to be forgotten, we bring one better than it or like it. In other words, we have some communications, we can cause them to be forgotten and bring ones better than it or like it. The Tafsir says, Tafsir al Jalalain says, uh, that this, was, this verse was revealed when uh, the disbelievers began to deride the matter of abrogation, saying that one day Muhammad enjoins his companions to one thing, and the next day he forbids it. So people are making fun of Muhammad, saying, you said one thing the other day, and now you're saying something else. Then verse chapter 2, verse 106 comes. We see a Wahidi saying, Muhammad is mocking his companions. One day he commands them to do something, and the next day he forbids them from doing it, or brings instead something which is easier. He is nothing but a calumniator who says things of his own invention. In response to this claim that Wahidi records, chapter 16, verse 101 states, and when we change one communication for another communication, Allah knows best what he reveals. They say, you are only a forger. Nay, most of them do not know. So in these two sections of the Quran, we have statements which clearly state, hey, at one point we said one thing, now we can say something else. If only you had the understanding of Allah, you would know that it is a good thing. So these are the ways we can solve the issue. First, uh, since Muhammad is the best interpreter of the Quran, we can see what role violence played in Muhammad's life. If he interprets the Quran the best through his life, let's see what role violence played in his life. Second, we can examine the Quran and Ahadi to see if they clearly tell us what to do in cases of the peace and violence. All right, so let's, let's uh, begin by taking a look at the life of Muhammad and seeing what we can uh, gather about violence in Islam. Uh, Muhammad uh, believed that he was called to be a prophet uh, around the year 610. For a while, he didn't preach openly, he preached in private. Uh, but after a while, he did begin preaching uh, openly. I uh, started telling the, the uh, pagan tribes that their religion was false and that they were going to uh, go to hell if they didn't believe in Allah. And eventually, the pagans started persecuting the Muslims. Now, uh, almost every Muslim I run into looks at this period of history and says, you know, how dare these people persecute uh, Muhammad? How intolerant, how intolerant of, of these people. Uh, I'd like to review a, a few facts here. One, the Meccans were fine with Muhammad preaching Islam at the beginning, as long as he wasn't condemning everyone else's gods. It was very pluralistic. Uh, Muslims and pagans, um, I mean, the, the, they were fine until Muhammad started openly saying that their religion was false. So the source of the conflict here at the beginning was Muhammad uh, criticizing the religion of others. Other than that, they would have been fine. Uh, two, the first blood that was shed between the two groups was shed by a Muslim. Um, Muslims and pagans got into a fight, and a Muslim named Saad picked up the jawbone of a camel and hit someone with it, and this was the first blood shed in the conflict uh, between the Meccans and uh, the Muslims. Three, even in Mecca, Muslims began responding violently when uh, people criticized Muhammad. When Muhammad's relative Hamza heard that Abu Jahl had insulted Muhammad, he hit Abu Jahl with a bow and said, will you insult him when I follow his religion? And, what he, and say what he says. Hit me if you can. Four, even in Mecca, Muhammad was planning to conquer Arabia. When the Meccans came to uh, Abu Talib to talk to him about Muhammad, they said, you know the trouble that exists between us and your nephew. So call him and let us make an agreement that he will leave us alone and we will leave him alone. Let him have his religion and we will have ours. They were trying to arrive at a peaceful solution. Uh, 
And Muhammad responded, You may give me one word by which you shall rule the Arabs and subject the Persians to you. He said that if they recite the Shahada, they would rule over the Arabs and, uh, and the Persians. So even in Mecca, when it's just a small group of Muslims, the idea is once we get everything together, we're going to go conquer the Persians, conquer the entire Arabian Peninsula. Five, Muhammad preached against the religious beliefs of the people of Mecca for 10 years, and he survived. Would I last 10 years if I preached against the religion of the people of Mecca today? If I went to Mecca today and started openly criticizing the religious beliefs of the inhabitants of Mecca, would I make it 10 years? Would I make it 10 months? <coughs> 10 days? If I stood outside the Kaaba like the Muslims were doing, condemning the religion of the people there, would I last 10 minutes? I don't believe I would. 10 seconds. And Muslims condemn the pagans for their intolerance when they allowed Muhammad to do this for 10 years. Six, when Muhammad was still in Mecca, he told, he walked into the Kaaba one day, walked around it, and then walked up to the people of Mecca and said, Verily, O Quraysh, I bring you slaughter. He announced to the people while he was still there that he was going to bring them slaughter. Seven, when the Meccans tried to kill Muhammad, Oh, look, they tried to kill Muhammad, how intolerant. Why did they try to kill Muhammad? Well, he had already announced to, announced to them that he was going to bring them slaughter. When we, uh, we read in Ibn Asaq, when the Quraysh saw that the apostle had a party and companions not of their tribe and outside their territory, and that his companions had migrated to join them and knew that they had settled in a new home and had gained new protectors, they feared that the apostle might join them since they knew that he had decided to fight them. Muhammad announces that he's going to slaughter people. He goes and starts building alliances with other tribes, and he decides he's going to move out of Mecca. The Meccans say, he's going to fight us. And they even tried to come up with it. They, tried to, they thought of confining him. They said, no, if we can find him, all these people are just going to attack us. And so they decided to kill. Now, in all of the history, in those 10 years, two people were killed. Two Muslims were killed. People were tortured. People were persecuted. I don't agree with persecution. I don't agree with killing anyone. Uh, but it's important to keep in mind the distinction here. Uh, when the Meccans were in control, things didn't go as nearly as bad as they did for the pagans later on when Muslims were in control, or the Jews when Muslims were in control. So we have a very different picture here. Picture here. So the pagans did persecute the Muslims, not too poorly. Um, yes, two people died, that's, that's horrible. Uh, 13 other people were injured. That's over a course of the whole time Islam was in Mecca before going to Medina. 15 total people, according to the records. And, well, at the end of this, when Muhammad had a chance to leave, uh, we know that the, the tribal leaders sent men to kill Muhammad the very last night before he, he flew to uh, Medina. Um, the bad time that he had when he was leaving, this was his opportunity to start a period of peace. Finally, he's no longer being persecuted. Finally, he can go to Medina and live in peace. Finally, he has the chance to show what Islam is really made of, if it is the religion of peace. But what happened? Muhammad leaves, he goes to Medina, and immediately he starts planning on how to raid caravans. Now, as, as Muhammad gets there, he notices one thing, and that is that when people send caravans out from Mecca, uh, they, they invest their funds into it, and when these funds come back, after having done their trading in far out places, then people will receive the money, and that's the money off which they will live. So Muhammad knows that if attacking these caravans is successful, he's cutting off the lifeblood of the Meccans. So he plans an attack. He doesn't lead it himself. He plans one. He sends people out. It fails. They come back. He sends them out again later. They shoot arrows this time, but it fails. It, it fails. They come back again. A third attack happens. It fails as well. Now Muhammad says, I'm in charge. Let's go together. Muhammad goes for a fourth raid. It fails. A fifth raid. It fails. The sixth raid fails. Now it's the seventh raid. And in the seventh raid, we're, we find ourselves in the holy month, the holy month which all the people of Saudi Arabia subscribe to. No one would ever believe that someone would dare attack anyone during the holy month. Muhammad, again, leading, it, it has sent his people out. The first person who's in line for this fight has shaved his head as part of the symbolism of subscribing to the holy month. So he looks like a pilgrim. He doesn't look like a warrior at all. The caravan sees this and they say, 
Well, this man is just a pilgrim. They don't fear him. Well, this was just part of the trap. The Muslims then attacked the caravan during the holy month. A man was killed. And this is the initiation of battles in Islam. This is how Badr then later happened. Then we see after that the battles of Oha, the battle of the trench, we see the battle of Khaybar. We see all sorts of battles happening from then on out. So when Muhammad finally had a chance to start peace, what do we know? He initiated battles that became never ending during his lifetime. Uh, so if we turn to the life of Muhammad, we see that when Muhammad was uh, outnumbered in Mecca, the call was uh, to peace. Later on, when Muhammad had an army around him, there was non-stop fighting until he died. Uh, so as far as the life of Muhammad is concerned, it would seem that the final marching orders of Muhammad are to fight. Now, if we turn to the Quran, we can confirm this. We can confirm this through, uh, through the Quran and through Muslim commentators. Uh, Muslims in the West are quick to point to surah, passages like Surah 2, 256. There is no compulsion uh, in religion as if this and a couple other uh, peaceful passages in the Quran uh, somehow provide the Muslims with their final marching orders. Uh, what they don't tell us is that, according to Muslim commentators, this, this verse has been abrogated. It was canceled by verses that came later. Ibn Kathir, considered by uh, many Muslims to be the greatest Quranic commentator of all time, says that 2256 was abrogated by verses like 973, 9123, and 4816, which call for fighting. Ibn Kathir says, Therefore, all people of the world should be called to Islam. If any one of them refuses to do so, or refuses to pay the jizya, they should be fought till they are killed. This is everyone is to be called and then fought until they're killed or until they pay the jizya. Surah 929 says this, Fight those who believe not in Allah nor the last day, nor hold that forbidden which hath been forbidden by Allah as messenger, nor acknowledge the religion of truth from among the people of the book, Christians and Jews until they pay the jizya with willing submission and feel themselves subdued. Notice what this says. It doesn't say, fight the oppressors. It doesn't say, fight people who are attacking you. It says, fight those who do not believe. These are people who have different beliefs from you, therefore you attack them. And the next verse makes that clear, by the way. Oh yes, yes, uh, uh, Surah, uh, Surah 930. Uh, that's where, according to Ibn Kathir, the reason for fighting the Jews and Christians is given. Uh, so the answer is found, and the Jews say Uzair is the son of Allah, and Christians say the Messiah is the son of Allah. These are the words of the mouths, they imitate the saying of those who disbelieve before. May Allah destroy them, how they are turned away. Ibn Kathir says, fighting the Jews and Christians is legislated because they are idolaters and disbelievers. Allah encourages the believers to fight the disbelieving Jews and Christians who uttered this terrible statement and other lies against Allah the Exalted. As for the misguidance of Christians over Isa, it is obvious. So why fight us? Because we're attacking? No, because we say Jesus is Lord. Is this us saying this? Absolutely not. It's a verse from the Quran being interpreted by one of the greatest commentators of Islamic history, Ibn Kathir. Now, uh, so Muslims are clearly called to fight, but it's clear that Muslims didn't always fight. So when are, when are Muslims allowed to seek peace? Uh, according to Surah 328, if Muslims feel threatened by a stronger adversary, they're allowed to pretend to be friendly for a time. As Ibn Kathir says, in this case, such believers are allowed to show friendship outwardly, but never inwardly. One of Muhammad's companions, Abu Darda, put it this way, we smile in the face of some people, though our hearts curse them. So if you're outnumbered in Mecca, or if you're outnumbered in a Western society where Islam is not the dominant religion, you pretend to be peaceful. Uh, but what if Muslims are in a position of power? Well, then the ruling changes. We read in Surah 4735, Be not weary and faint-hearted, crying for peace when you should be uppermost. According to Ibn Kathir again, this means that Muslims shouldn't compromise, seek peace, or end fighting with non-Muslims when Muslims are in a position of power. Well, Ibn Kathir, when are Muslims, again, allowed to be peaceful? He tells us, if the disbelievers are considered more powerful and numerous than the Muslims, then the Imam may decide to hold a treaty if he judges that it entails a benefit for Muslims. Are you noticing a pattern here? If Muslims are strong, they're told to fight everyone. If they're weak, they're told to pretend to be friendly and to seek a temporary peace while they build up enough strength to attack. Is this a religion of peace? This is a religion that pretends to be peaceful so long as people aren't strong enough to conquer. 
Now, I, I know some people in the audience are shaking their heads, and I can understand that because I was in your shoes once. Maybe, maybe David and I, maybe David and I are interpreting things entirely incorrectly. Maybe we're looking at the Quran, and since we're not Muslims, we are misinterpreting everything. Well, I think what I've been told from day one, when I don't understand the Quran, I should turn to the Hadith. I should see from the Hadith what we find. Does the life of Muhammad, as, as shared by Imam Bukhari and Imam Muslim, uh, corroborate that which I'm saying, or does it show an opposite opinion? Well, let me show you from Sahih Bukhari, uh, starting from Sahih Bukhari, verse uh, number 69-24. I have been ordered to fight the people till they say, none has the right to be worshipped but Allah. And whoever says, la ilaha illallah, Allah will save his property and his life from me. So I've been ordered to fight people until they say, la ilaha illallah, 69-24. Same Muslim number 30. I have been commanded to fight against people so long as they do not declare, la ilaha illallah. Uh, but are these are these solitary occasions? Is this just something in general, or is Islam is fighting in Islam not an afterthought? Is it is it something that's prescribed to people as main uh, a core of the religion? If we look at Sayyid Bukhari number 2785, a man came to Allah's messenger and said, "Guide me to such a deed as equals jihad." And Muhammad said, "I find no such deed." In 2796, the Prophet said, A single endeavor of fighting in Allah's cause in the afternoon or the forenoon is worth more than the entire world and whatever is in it. Fighting worth more than the world and whatever is in it. 2795, the Prophet said, Nobody who dies and finds good with Allah would wish to come back to this world, even if you were given the whole world and whatever is in it, except the martyr, who, upon seeing the superiority of martyrdom, would wish to come back to this world and die again. So, what, what I'm seeing here is it doesn't seem to be that fighting is just an afterthought or a supporting, uh, supporting issue. It's a matter of the very core. It's better than everything there is. There's no better deed than fighting. Uh, and, and, and dying for Allah's cause is not just something Muhammad is saying abstractly. This is not a, a metaphorical concept. In fact, Muhammad makes it extremely clear, even about himself. He says in Sayyid Bukhari number 2797, By him in whose hand my soul is, I would love to be martyred in Allah's cause, and then come back to life, and then get martyred, and come back to life, and get martyred, and come back to life, and get martyred. So Muhammad is not saying this in some sort of metaphorical sense. He's saying, I would love to fight and die, and fight and die, and fight and die. So we looked at the life of Muhammad, and we see a clear progression towards violence. We've looked at Quranic passages, and when we look at the commentators, the peaceful passages are the earlier passages, and Muhammad's final marching orders, by the way, Surah 9, where we find the command to fight those who do not believe, is either the last or next to last Surah revealed. These are Muhammad's final marching orders. So the Quran agrees with us. When we turn to Islam's greatest commentators, we find that the peaceful passages have been abrogated, and that Muhammad's final marching orders were to fight everyone. And when we turn to the Hadith, we find that Muhammad, commanded, uh, Muhammad was commanded to fight people until they recite the Shahada. Everything is in agreement on this issue. And yet, our friends, uh, our friends disagree with us. Our Muslim friends, Abdullah and Yahya, disagree with us. Abdullah says, what is peace? He gave several different definitions. Um, and I would agree that a religion can be peaceful in various ways. For instance, he says that a religion can provide mental peace. I, I don't have any objections there. I do have an objection that you know you provide mental peace by giving a simple theology. The simplest theology is atheism. Uh, so, uh, I don't necessarily think that makes it uh, the most peaceful uh, mentally. Uh, he says that Islam does not seek to humiliate people. Well, uh, again, the commentators would disagree. Uh, uh, Asyuti, uh, he gives several uh, he gives several definitions of what uh, the Muslims were to do to, to the dhimmis, how these dhimmis were to be treated. Ibn Abbas says that state of abasement, when it says that we are to be in a state of abasement, uh, means that we are pushed, they push us around. Uh, Ibn Abi Hatim transmitted that. It is uh, transmitted that Al-Mughira uh, told Rastam, I call you to Islam or else you must pay the jizya while you are in a state of abasement. He said, I know what jizya means, but what does a state of abasement mean? He replied, you pay it while you are standing and I am sitting and the whip is hanging over your head. Abu Shaykh related that Sa'id ibn uh, Musaid said, I prefer that the people of the Dhimma be, become tired by paying the jizya, since he says, until they pay the jizya with their own hands in a state of complete abasement. It is used as proof by those who say that it is taken in a humiliating way. And so the taker sits and the dhimmi stands with his head bowed and his back bent. The jizya is placed in the balance and the taker seizes his beard and hits his chin. This is how 
Denny's were to be treated. We were to come to you crawling on all fours, were to grab us by our beards, wouldn't work with me, and then hit us in our chins. This is not supposed to be humiliating, but this is what your com this is what Islam's greatest commentators say. This is what we find from Ibn Abbas and us to UT. And why are they saying this? Because of the verse in the Quran, 929, where it says, they pay the jizya with willing submission and feel themselves subdued. So it's not commentators coming up with things. This is coming from their interpretation of the Quran. No, I, I have some responses. Um, Abdullah also uh, mentioned a quotation from me from while I was in Isna. Um, that, that was that was a week ago, and I posted a comment based on what I was seeing and the problems of preaching a, a peaceful Islam in light of the fact that all of the early history says something different. As part of that quotation, uh, as part of that response, I believe it was part of the response, I could be wrong, he quotes a verse where he says, oppression is worse than slaughter. That is a verse from the Quran, uh, chapter 2, verse 217. Let me give you the whole verse. Uh, he didn't quote the whole verse. The whole verse says, they ask thee, thank you, they ask thee concerning fighting in the prohibited month, i.e., they're asking you about fighting during the sacred month. Say, fighting therein is a grave offense, but graver is it in the sight of Allah to prevent access to the path of Allah, to deny him to prevent access to the sacred mosque, and drive out its members. Tumult and oppression are worse than slaughter. So what was the context of that? The context was, it's okay for you to kill someone during the holy month. That was revealed right after the Nakhla raid that I had mentioned, which was the start of the series of battles that Muhammad induced. Uh, one more point on uh, uh, Abdullah pointed out that the jizya was a simple tax, and it's okay because you know you're, you're, everyone pays taxes. Uh, let me read one passage for you, Sahih al-Bukhari, number, uh, number 2338. Umar expelled the Jews and Christians from Hejaz. Uh, when the messenger had conquered Kaibar, he wanted to expel the Jews from it as its land became the property of Allah, his messenger and the Muslims. Allah's messenger intended to expel the Jews, but they requested to let them stay there on condition that they would do the labor and get half the fruits. What were they supposed what was the jizya there? They had to pay half of everything they produced on their land. Is that a simple tax? That's quite a bit, and when we look at the various sources, we can see how much there was no set dimmy tax. Uh, it's whatever people could, uh, whatever people we could get out of people without them rioting or something. And in many cases, we find 25 percent, 50 percent, and so on. This is in Sahih al Bukhari. So we only have three and a half minutes left. I'd like to briefly mention the fact that violence, as we see it in Islam, is not just directed towards unbelievers. So far, we've been talking about unbelievers, but it's also directed towards many other people, and it seems. Uh, it seems that in many cases the solution to problems is just simply violence. Um, when it comes to apostates, uh, in, if we look in Sayyid Bukhari, number 6921, it says female apostates should be killed. 6922 says that anyone who leaves Islam must be killed. 6923 says that Muhammad ordered apostates to be killed. 6924, as you recall, this was four in a row. 6924 said, I've, I've been ordered to fight the people until they say, La ilaha illallah. What about 6930? It says, Muslims who kill apostates will have a reward on the day of resurrection. I don't think I could ever have mental peace in an area where I'm not free to believe whatever I want about God. Uh, we don't just see this with regard to apostates. We see the same thing with regard to critics. Again, uh, when even when Muhammad was in Mecca, his followers would respond violently when Muhammad was criticized. When they actually had more power, this became more severe. So we see Abu Afaq, a man who was, a man, a man who was more than 100 years old, being killed brutally for uh, criticizing Islam. Uh, Asma, when she saw this, uh, when she saw what Muslims did to this man, she wrote a poem uh, inviting people to stand up against Muhammad. She was brutally killed for this. We see over and over again people being killed for criticizing Muhammad. Now think about this. Muhammad was free to say anything he wanted about any of the pagans, any of their gods, any of their forefathers, anything he wanted, and you're horrible and intolerant if you react to that. But you say one word against Muhammad and you deserve death. Why the inconsistency? I also I'd like to point out that uh, there, and this is a very sore topic for many people, and we don't have too much time left anyway, but I do want to open it up for discussion in case it comes up in the rest of this debate. Um, violence towards women is not something that's unheard of in Islam by any means. We have chapter 4, verse 34 of the Quran, which of course says, if you fear disobedience on their part, first leave them alone in their seeking places, then, um, did I say that wrong? Uh, first admonish them, then leave them alone in their sleeping places, and finally beat them. Um, there's various interpretations of this. If you want to it is the whole verse. It is the whole verse. 
And if they desist from disobedience, not not okay. if they desist from disobedience, then then you have nothing to hold against them. Sure, but uh, but hitting is is permitted. Um, I heard at the the um, last conference I was at Isna that it is a mutawatir hadith that Muhammad never hit any woman in his whole life, and we should use his example. Well, I approached the sheikh who said that, and I said, could you please explain to me Sahih Muslim number twenty one twenty seven, where Muhammad hit Aisha, causing her pain. He looked at me and said, I did not know of such a hadith which is there, Sayyid Muslim 2127. So we can discuss this if need be. I think it's time for me to wrap up. There's 30 seconds left, and I would like to simply say this. I hope David and I are wrong. I hope our interpretation of Islam is entirely false. I hope we can, be, we can lose this debate tonight. The fact of the matter is, we don't think so, and that's why we're here tonight. But if Abdullah and Yahya can show us that Islam is peaceful, we will be thankful, and that's hopefully what will happen. If not, though, I would like you all to reconsider what you think about Islam, whether it is actually the religion of peace.